back at the film school. I had a Scottish nickname. But I won't tell you now. I'll better tell you a joke. Coronavirus, Spanish flu and Black Death are charting in a pub. My main goal is not to kill people, but to raise awareness of access to public health, says coronavirus. Oh, there's millennials, thinks Black Death. My dream as a filmmaker has always been to make a film without people in frame. Objects speak to me more about people than people themselves, don't they? After all, we never value anything or anyone before we lose them. If you truly want to realize how important people are, try to imagine the world without them. I don't have to imagine it now. I see it, the empty world. A good film can't make it without a good story. To me, a good story means searching for something or somebody. The only human I now can search for is her. I wondered why she had chosen me than a film school student, or if she soon felt her choice proved wrong. I was young and ambitious. She shared my dream. However, the life turned out somewhat different. I managed to sell my very first script for a good price. Someone would think it's a great luck. It was a very deceptive and misguiding luck. My early success immediately got me into a comfort niche. I have never dared to leave. The better I earned, the more I spent. The more I spent, the more I needed. Having to make the ends meet killed my confidence while I saw my ex-schoolmates becoming celebrities. Yes, I am a screenwriter who have always wanted to become a film director. It's a very usual thing for those who write. Directors sport tuxedos on the red carpets. They are regarded as the true film authors. Writers most often stay in shadows. Their scripts never visualized as they were planned. And their films remaining nothing more than a dream. I have dreamed and written films for years. Is this my last chance to actually film? If so, it's a tiny one. No cost, no crew. Yet isn't it what I have always dreamed about? After all, I still had my smartphone camera working. How did I usually start a script? Of course, a good story should start from a visual image. Once relaxing in his room after a dinner, Leo Tolstoy was haunted by a beautiful woman he imagined. That woman would become Anna Karenina. Visualizing is even more important for a director or for a scriptwriter who wants to be one. Well, I usually wrote two scripts for the same story. One for sale. Nothing more than the plot and dialogues. 
the other one for myself. Actually a film on paper, as if I were the director. Directors don't like when you write too much about camera movements and shots. They feel like you enter their area of responsibility, which is true. However, you cannot take away writers' rights to fantasize a bit. Believe me, it's even better for a script. Of course, a good script must have some logic behind. Yeah, well, that's logic. We see drops and think it's been raining beyond. Yet it's just a sequence of events. We never know what we see. Is it a pool or a piece of sky within asphalt? Is this ruin nasty or picturesque? As a child, I fantasized the film I would make when I grew up. I visualized just one shot of that film. A cowboy getting off his horse next to a lonely little wooden house on the prairie. I enjoyed the feeling of this cowboy's life before and after the shot. It was both beyond and in. This is how you write books. This is how you make films. You can't recreate every second of one's life, yet you can make it felt. You know the Cameron by Giovanni Boccaccio, 800 years ago. There was uh, another plague in Florence, Italy. Quite a usual thing, then. A bunch of youngsters decide to kill their time away from the city, not to get killed in. Telling each other stories is a time killer. Ten narrators... Ten stories every day. Each day has a topic for all the narrators to follow. I love that story. A woman hides her lover into a barrel because her husband is back home. She says, Hubby, I've sold the barrel and the buyer is inside checking if it's strong enough. The lover gets out, instructs the husband to clean the barrel, and takes it home. That barrel, it could be for wine. All wine stores are closed now. I emptied my last bottle two weeks ago. Or it could be for a Diogenes. You know that guy? Looking for honest people with a lantern daytime? And I'm looking for the woman I love. Well, it's quite meaningless. I came here to write for another cash-paying silly TV show. We agreed she would join me a few days later for a vacation. The outbreak. Flights cancelled. Borders closed. All of a sudden, we got disconnected for a couple of weeks, as I had planned. I'm foolish enough to search for her through the city's empty streets. Looking for your sweetheart in a place where she can't be still doesn't stop you from sudden thinking it's her over there. Yet it's too mad. It's overly mad to think so in a place with everyone indoors. As a writer said, you can know a city from how they work here, how they love here, and how they die here. 
in modern times, it's too much interconnected. Excuse me for this word. It's feverishly interconnected. People rush and rush and rush, working, before they rush into another weekend. Then they rush entertaining themselves. Dining, movies, popcorn, computer games, all nothing more than a socially established habit. Every Monday, it starts over and over again. Earning money to eat and eating to earn money. Marketing pens used for stuff meeting discussion on marketing pens. You're going to tell me it's uh, everywhere like this. Well, you are absolutely right. Feverish life doesn't tolerate you having a real fever. Then kindly suffer alone and join us soon. Or not. Then we'll send condolences to your relatives. And maybe share rest in peace avatars in our social accounts. It happened. First, there were some rumors. Another infection far away. Nobody cared anywhere except that very far away place. There have been so many Hollywood films about epidemic that a real one seemed to everybody as another blockbuster with a couple of stars saving the world another time. However, that new story didn't fade away. It only grew. Soon it was one and the only news story in all media. Terrorism, migration, climate change, all those were gone. Miraculously gone. Which makes me think the world exists as long as media broadcasted. Someone said we are Buddha's dream. Well, we are mass media's dream. To be more accurate, we are their nightmare. And they are ours. Anyway, how did it start in this city? Someone had a vacation far away and almost died upon return. Or simply died without any almost. After rumors circulating for a while, media took it over and pressed the city government for urgent action to protect residents from a then mysterious disease. The government wasn't going to do anything at that time. Oh, pardon me, they did. They gathered for a meeting to discuss the situation. A disaster is actually a usual thing. However, you can hardly believe it before it happens to you. Plagues and wars have always been here. Yet always abroad and sudden. If it still starts, people would say, okay, it cannot last long. It would be foolish if it did. Of course it is. Yet it still does. A disaster, a nightmare, a bad dream, something unreal. It's going to be over soon. No, it's not. People are. Few dozens of large plague epidemics have killed 100 million people so far in history. Yet death is no more stats, only when you see it with your own eyes. A plague in Bologna daily killed few thousands half a millennium ago. I think it's as many as a very large cinema complex can seat. Well, could. Next, after the government meeting, the disease took another step ahead. There was one more critical case. Later that week, the government hanged modest epidemic guidelines on tiny leaflets 
distributed around the city near supermarkets. You know those young men and women? They hand out a paper as you pass by. You don't take it usually. Or you take to help them finish their job, and then you throw it away into the next garbage bin. Well, if you care, the leaflet guy is watching. They're actually not. You'll probably pretend reading and carry it till another garbage bin. I didn't throw that leaflet. I took it to my hotel and read it. The guidelines made it clear nobody realized how serious the situation was. It seemed the government was ready to sacrifice a lot, not to worry people. There are only few cases of a disease, the leaflet said, yet it's still early to assert it's contagious. People were asked to keep calm, wash their hands, and immediately call a doctor if they felt bad. They were obliged to immediately report their ill family members to the government and support their hospitalization. Hospitals are fully equipped, they said. People were promised fast and full recovery. In the next few days, many people learned a new word from the media. That word was pandemic. This new knowledge overturned everything in a second. A week passed in silence and suspense. It was a truly Hitchcock suspense. Then came another official statement, and another word to learn. It was lockdown. That was when the disease became everyone's common concern. Before the city found itself disconnected from the entire world, everyone here, even though worried, had been living their usual lives. Then it happened. A trap. No, I wasn't alone. Many people in the city were on a short trip at the time of lockdown. Mothers and children, husbands and wives, lovers and lovers, they were sure they would reunite soon. They didn't know they wouldn't. In fact, the lockdown had started few hours before the official announcement. During few hours after, the government was attacked by requests from people who asked for an exceptional permission to leave and suggested best excuses possible and still impossible. Everyone finally understood then that no is no. Exception, favor, all those words were now meaningless. Those who had left the city before the outbreak were still allowed entry but were informed that's a one-way ticket. Everyone eventually returned 
choosing a lockdown at home instead of the same lockdown abroad. Frankly, I didn't feel sorry to stay here. First of all, I wanted to check my wife's feelings about me. Second, I wanted to make a film I had been dreaming about all my life. A film about love and people around, showing neither. Third, this time let me feel what every human being is, a lonely stranger. Once separated from the entire world, we found it's no more pandemic to us. It was citidemic. Quite selfish, I do realize it. I'm not going to tell you all those rules and guidelines. After all, you must have had the same in your place of living, mustn't you? In any case, workplaces were closed. People suddenly found themselves on unexpected vacation. Unexpected and unpaid. And absolutely unaware how to make themselves busy. Day after day, they rambled their streets, remembering their weekend routine entertainment, so boring and so lovely. Or morning evening commuting, traffic jams, they miss them so much now. Football fans, when the championship was suspended, they first discussed when it was going to restart, then how to appoint the champion. With their last hope dying, they began to gather near the stadium every Sunday at 7 p.m. The game time. Of course, it was against the rules of social distancing and was soon stopped by police, even though football lovers themselves. People were now prisoners of the city. They were supposed to love as a home. That was the torture of all prisoners and those on exile. Live in oneself's memories while you no more need any memory. Think about the past non-stop. While the present was full of regrets and future. Well, future was not for everyone anymore. Nobody gave it a second thought. Yet we still hardly realized what had happened to us. We only suffered from our disrupted routines. It made us angry. But anger is not the best weapon to fight a pandemic with. Of course, we blamed the government. Many of us enjoyed playing conspiracy games and accused the mayor of inventing the danger as an opportunity to seize more power. Those games didn't even stop when the mayor's mother caught the virus and soon died. Soon the government started publishing stats. When they wrote 302 had died during the recent week, those numbers told us nothing. Nobody knew how many people normally died in the city per week. Someone might shrug shoulders and say, come on, seasonal flu kills too. Yet shoulders moved down when the next week's number proved twice as high. Rumors began to spread. The city had no storage of petrol or food to survive long enough. Strange enough, the most valued and purchased a set of those early days was toilet paper. 
people were certainly going to die with their asses clean. Not to disgrace the planet before a possible alien invasion. Petrol was soon out of stock anyway. People drove no more. People took buses no more. There was still subway left. Why would people of work need subway, you will ask? They just needed to make an illusion of traveling for themselves. So they took the trains and rode endless circles. Of course, such overcrowding made infection cases sore. At first, government restricted the subway hours, but it ended up with even larger crowds waiting before the stations. So they finally locked it entirely. The usual urban music of tires and engines was now replaced by a walker's silence. The walking alive. Still alive. Deaths were still growing. A new restriction followed. No more walks except for groceries, pharmacy, or to walk one's dog. I didn't know people had that many dogs in this city. And it was so usual to see how those dog walkers ran into each other, keeping distance cautiously, while their four-legged permission grants didn't care. Smartphones turned out the very tool of control. If a walk exceeded 30 minutes, someone at the top decided it was enough. You received an SMS, followed by police finding you and taking you home if you still ignored. Soon there was another joke. It's a government meeting. The police minister's speech is like, we need to set a curfew, shut down newspapers and websites and arrest everyone critical of the government. The Minister of Health questions how it's going to help against the virus. And the police minister is like, what virus? Interesting enough, nobody opted for switching off their smartphones. After all, people depended on social networks more than ever. That's why there were lots of speculation that nobody would even want to leave this virtual social cocoon when finally allowed. This new society had new roles. Self-proclaimed experts shared graphs from medical websites, calculated death rates versus case rates, checked the weather reports and predicted we would be soon free or dead. Both kinds of predictions failed again and again. Both of them. Stay-homers published their masked stay-home photos, ironically shot outdoors, seemingly on a nice walk. Don't stay-homers daily and hopefully checked countries with no restriction where the death rates were low. Still low. Future studies experts anticipated either 1984 or a brave new world at home. Working online, learning online, and making love online. Conspiracy theorists told the virus was not real or real, but invented and blamed America China, Frank Mason's Big Pharma, then again America, for using it to take over the world. 
that nobody could thrive on this shitty chaos the world turned into didn't convince them to stop. They were watching Steven Soderbergh's contagion, saying, Look! How could he know it? Come on, people, relax. He didn't know it. There were many epidemics. After all, no 11, 12 or 13 film stars ever robbed a casino in Las Vegas. Self-appointed comedians published memes non-stop. Memes about washing your hands and keeping cool. About having sex at one meter distance. About a guy pouring olive oil onto the floor in his kitchen for a treadmill. About a man disguised as a green bush to leave his home unchecked by police. About exhausted dogs forced to walk with everyone in the family. About summer vacations in other rooms of your apartment. About husbands getting mad with their isolation and stabbing their wives. About wives getting mad with their isolation and stabbing their husbands. About shepherds working from home. Zoo workers working from home. Cleaners working from home. About teachers compared to musicians of the Titanic. Food delivery bikers compared to musicians of the Titanic. And of course, about the very meme makers compared to musicians on the Titanic. I had favorite meme series. It started with swans back in Venus channels because of economy shutdown. Actually, they had always been there. Then followed by the Loch Ness monster back to the lake. King Kong back to New York. And my favorite, Matrix code seen through the now clean air. In any case, what is absolutely evident now? Humans' millennial impact on the environment is tiny and reversible. We are nothing for this planet. Just nothing. Like a virus. Do viruses have plans? Yes, they do. It's making people change theirs. People can't live without any plan. Even on quarantine. You set a goal to rationalize your failure. To find something positive within four walls of your confinement. Learning a new language, reading ten new books, watching free access Vienna Opera Classics, or free access Berlin Philharmonic Classics, or Metropolitan Museum free tours, or all Game of Thrones seasons, the latter mission accomplished indeed. Of course, people entertained themselves as they could, taking every effort of theirs online, however good or dull. There were famous hits sung at homes with the newly written quarantine lyrics. Parody photos imitating famous portraits became a fashion. Got pouring sanitizer onto Adam's hand. A casserole for a crown and a mop for a spear. It was still old, good, boring pandemic postmodernism. Yet when a psychologist wrote an article saying the quarantine would crash families, I guess those spouse-stabbing memes were his reference, I felt he was utterly wrong. I loved imagining how parents and children together invented those painting parodies, many of which were very creative. 
I even thought what we could do together, me and my wife, if she were with me, if she were. That was a time of split-screen coronavirus video clips made in a rush and hurry by famous bands forced to cancel their concerts. Were they trying to make some money or just not to get themselves off records? Those who can't play arranged video conferences touching their faces. I'm just kidding, one more time. People also started sharing their top 10 lists. Footballers, foods, books and films. Looks like farewell to human civilization. Come on, people. It's not over yet. Films. It's still a mystery to me how it's possible to make such a list. Yet I want to share what style I like. Shots as long as possible. And camera moving instead of cut every two seconds. Actors need more time to act. Watchers need a chance to feel how time flows. But this video clip approach has spoiled everything. It's corrupted the way how we see the world. People cannot concentrate on anything longer than two seconds. So they can't even give a second thought to what they are told by mass media. I said before. A few countries with relatively mild restrictions were looked at with hope by those who objected lockdown. Actually, those countries were a source of hope for everyone. But there was another kind of hope too. That for death rates in those countries, rising the higher the better. For particularly hysterical stay-homers, the opposite would mean that they are staying home, gaining kilos and losing money, were wrong. It was also clear that most people had badly studied math at school. Absolute numbers caught everyone's attention. One million cases, 100,000 deaths, People hardly understood the uh, per capita concept. Which is good on the other side. Lives are not percentage stats after all. Every life matters. But I was scared how quickly people adapted to new and new restrictions. It was just enough to watch another viral video from a crowded hospital somewhere on the globe. 30 minutes is not that little, someone might say, while others manage to cheat the system for another half an hour. Everyone wore a mask. Nobody cared. The virus was so small that it could penetrate any mask. Some designers were very fast making it an accessory in all possible colors with all kinds of patterns. My Facebook wall was full of mask commercials for any price. Buy a lifelong mask and get another for free. A lifelong. Well, masks were mandatory. You could be fined if police caught you without it. People wore rubber gloves, which made them look weird. Like safe crackers who, stealing another million dollars, don't want to leave their fingerprints. All of that was called flattening the curve. But Kacha heroes didn't know they were flattening the curve. They just fled to survive, to avoid a deadly virus. 
So did people now, they thought. They didn't know they were forced inside not to avoid the virus, but to catch it later for immunity. Why not now? Because hospitals might get busy. The economic crisis, bankruptcy suicides, postponed chemotherapies, exhaustive isolation, closed borders, separated families. It was all because of bed numbers. Sorry, I'm too sarcastic, I know. What certainly deserves everyone's sarcasm is how politicians never forgot blaming each other or the pandemic for election campaign purposes, of course. Sometimes this exchange of tweeted opinions became so heated that it was obvious that parties fighting each other had entirely forgotten about fighting the virus. What would Mercutius from Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet say if he lived and died in our days? Coronavirus on both your houses? Where was I? Oh, yes. When people began to adapt to their lives online, the web traffic got worse. That should certainly have been expected given all that quarantine online self-appointed celebrities showing off. To tackle this problem, and for economy purposes, the government began to switch off electricity at homes since 11 p.m. Then, since 9 p.m. Were they also going to fill in the demographic gap? With its lights off, Stone City got stone cold. A pile of cubes massive and lifeless in the moonlight, if any. Death rates kept on rising. Someone was frantically looking for any cure. Ginger Index nearly replaced Big Mac Index. A website daily published addresses where the infected had been found. New and new addresses. One of them wasn't too far from my hotel. I couldn't stop myself from walking there. Of course, it looked as usual. What truly showed the infection spreading. Earlier, it was a death told about by the media, then a death told about by someone else, an occasional strander passing by me and speaking on the phone, and then it was the reception girl's mother. The girl herself was tested negative, so all of us, only few residents trapped by the lockdown, were allowed to stay as usual. Yet probably never before had people been so united. Never before had a single life been so valued. After all, one death less on a daily graph promised one more step towards freedom and safety for all. People even began helping each other, bringing groceries to an ill neighbor's door, paying the internet bill for the broke, It became another routine. The last day of Pompeii is a beautiful picture, but the real disaster day after day becomes an ugly habit. This pandemic was a kind of mechanism, meticulous, mathematic, and death-bringing. That was one of the hardest things to tolerate. The enemy was faceless, bodiless. 
Nobody took that nasty cartoonish green ball with suckers as a real virus impersonation. Do you know what COVID-19 and Samuel Colt's famous revolver share in common? Both are great equalizers. Billionaires, sports celebrities, politicians. All of them are immune as little as everyone else and have to stay home as everyone else. Of course, between a villa in Beverly Hills and a tiny down market studio, I would choose a former. Might be my favorite story about an epidemic is Edgar Allan Poe, The Mask of the Red Death. A terrible plague kills everyone. People die bleeding in sharp pains within half an hour. There was a rich, luxury-loving and selfish prince. The writer actually calls him happy, brave and smart instead. Yet I think that was sarcasm. He was certainly rich and selfish and he couldn't live without luxury. The prince gathered 1,000 nobles in a castle to wait till the end of the epidemic. They had enough food and drinks to enjoy during a year, skillful musicians and dancers to entertain themselves. The castle doors were welded shut At a masquerade ball five or six months later, Prince sees a stranger in a death mask and dies in a second, angrily trying to take it off. Soon everyone in the castle was dead. Not the right story to support the quarantine idea, is it? Neither is a journal of the plague year by Daniel Defoe, another diary format by this uh, Robinson Crusoe guy. He loved it, didn't he? Well, the journal's protagonist, after a few unsuccessful attempts to leave uh, plague struck London, decides to stay and survives. The only wisdom he and us can derive is a micro-poem finalizing the book. A dreadful plague in London was in the year 65, which swept an hundred thousand souls away, yet I alive. Anyway, after the pandemic, I would probably have been commissioned to adapt one of those plague books for the screen. But I have an original story on my mind. It's a far future. People live in the new post-apocalyptic Stone Age. They wear animal hides and live in caves. They believe in an evil god called Coronavirus, who likes people to cover their faces and doesn't like them to walk too much. Of course, except especially privileged priests of that god. In any case, that wouldn't be my film. That would be someone else's film. My memory is slowly pulling the focus and choosing colors. Memory is a good painter and a pencil drawer and a great master of optical illusions. Yet I am like a trembling shadow, 
recalling foliage in the wind, oil light, or pebbles after rain, or wires cutting through the sky, or the ones to write music for the church chorus on, then poles supporting clouds and wires again, rusty roofs, corners, and butt ends with a couple of windows thrown onto, and the close up of a street light as a new character on stage. Street lights do know what it means to be lonely. Our video called Love got squeezed down to the size of a smartphone screen. I saw myself so small in the corner. She was actually in the same quarantine situation, a thousand miles away, yet she was home. Our home, or hers only. Our love was probably still with us, but it was a heavy burden of disconnection. It was a futureless patience and stubborn expectation. I felt like in a long, long grocery queue. or in a pharmacy queue. The more I waited, the less prone I felt to leave. Even though it was clear the earlier I left, the more sense it would make. Have you noticed how often I use us instead of them? I was no more stranger here. It now was my city. Mission failed. Even the city's past, which certainly had gone without my presence, now was part of my memory. I watched the city's old black and white photos and recognize the places. That little happily smiling boy with an ice cream. Could it be me? That little happily smiling girl on a merry-go-round. Could it be her, my wife? There is reality in front of Canberra and beyond it. In frame and off frame. You see the former and feel the latter. The cowboy jumping off his horse was a little boy long time before. My film I dream of making. It's nothing more than an album of photos. So is every film. No more than a sequence of still shots. No, I still don't like cutting it every second. I like watching it long enough to fill time to feel eternity, to feel people off the frame, people forced to hide. The year getting closer to summer, and days are therefore getting sunnier and sunnier, the feeling of a dangerous virus hiding around the corner began to disappear slowly. Per capita became a new Latin spell to ward it off. After all, the death rate proved not that high 
when calculated against population numbers. It had been repeatedly done before. But miss this important cheerful optimism raising ingredient, sunshine. Or probably it was just tiredness. The inflation of fear. People had been frightened too much and too long. They adapted to viral videos and death rate graphs. Quarantine became the new reality they had adapted to. You stop noticing whatever you adapt to, so nobody discussed the pandemic news anymore. Or it could be historic memory. Somewhere deep in their DNA, people remember what a pandemic is. They didn't see dead bodies in streets, so didn't feel the danger. Or they had just watched too many epidemic movies with more or less similar outcome. And then, all of a sudden, new deaths and infection cases began to decline. It began to happen everywhere, not just here. Nobody actually knows why. Someone said vaccinations from other viruses had proved effective. Or a wrong harmful treatment had been finally stopped. Or the summer heat coming had killed the virus. Or the entire world was run out of money and food and the governments decided to stop testing or change a diagnosis criteria. People still died from thousands of reasons, as they had been doing, yet the world felt happiness coming soon. No, people will not hurry up to celebrate. The pandemic will have taught them to be careful and kill their trust and habit to hope easily. And as I said, they had just got used to the new reality. However much that reality was boring, exhaustive and unacceptable, the promise they would be back to normal soon was too sudden. It's like spending a few hours in an uncomfortable low coaster seat. The plane has landed. You have to get up and go. You know, you want to get up and go. But you have to pull yourself together and overcome a strange, brief wish to stay. Now everyone will be again watching those almost forgotten, almost abandoned death graphs closely and feeling anxiety. People will be still dying, still get infected. Hidden joy will grow in people's hearts indeed, very, very slowly. That will be the next phase. Someone will still be dying, but look, The death graph is down, they will shout. Plans for future will be discussed again with some sudden reservations not to scare the luck away. The virus will be seemingly losing its power. Medicines tried with no cure will suddenly heal everyone. No, I'm far from underestimating doctors and medicine. Human intelligence has perfectly eliminated many dangers which are never back. 
plague included. However, any new danger, any new virus blinds us. There will be still some counterattacks, taking away a few victims, lost victims of the pandemic. The government will finally publish good news that the disease is being over. And people will trust it as reluctantly as he accepted early pandemic announcement. The virus will leave as strangely as it came. Yet someone will say it hasn't. There is time for aggression, war and occupation. And there is time for peaceful colonization. In any case, quite a few people will still rush between joy and fear, hardly abandoning strict quarantine rules. Someone will stay at home long after it's no more needed. To the police's surprise, there will be attempts to break through and leave the city on the last days of lockdown. Why? Maybe out of fear to catch the virus and die before freedom is back? When the lockdown is finally over, of course there will be celebrations. People will spend the last money at overcrowded restaurants and waiters will sweat and curse. Fashion shops will sell out last season collections but there will also be some nostalgia for that family quarantine fun. After all, it was a very quarantine that took people out of their boring social roles and helped some of them realize what they are. Or it might be that syndrome from the famous Shawshank Redemption. First you hate your imprisonment, then you adapt to it, and finally you love it. You hang yourself and write, Brooks was here. Of course, I am overplaying it. A month or two can change nothing. The previous social routine will eventually take over. Chanel will star the next season with a little black mask. Apple will offer a stylish new model of their watch, measuring your body temperature non-stop and calling ambulance for you if something is wrong. Of course, shaking hands will die for long. But air carriers and travel agencies will bombard people with extra cheap offerings and people will travel in crowds again for another pile of selfies in front of you choose what? Welcome to a new pandemic. And there will be dozens of books. Expert. Have you heard quotation marks in my voice? Expert statements. Conferences. Films and politicians I told you election campaigns. Nationalists will call to close borders and globalists will advocate for the world government. Rightists will demand lower taxes and leftists will demand higher taxes. Lucky survivors kissing icons and temple doors will want more religion and... Okay, those guys are unique and unpaired. Pro-quarantine and anti-quarantine will both claim credit for the civilization's survival. Here comes another joke. A madman is clapping his hands in a mental hospital. When asked why, he says, 
I'm scaring crocodiles away. When told there are no crocodiles, he replies, Of course, I told I'm scaring them away. Well, everyone's going to have some fun in some business. Only those who lost parents or siblings or children will feel forever alone. With the borders finally open, will my wife come here? They told the virus is only dangerous for people over 70. They were wrong, at least in my case. I had no initial mild symptoms. It started suddenly and finished me quickly. As another writer said, I died at 7 a.m. After all, it was something to start the day with. On the positive side, no police patrol can anymore charge me for walking outside. The dead man's memory is in pieces. I have no idea how much time I have left. But the world is dulling away, or I am. The wind will soon close the last window with dusty glass. Then the bird said nevermore. My memory suggests me some relief with this beautiful view. You know, this is how I always imagined a view from our bedroom window. Mine and hers, a screenwriter trapped in a city during a pandemic, is searching for his wife who can't be there and is trying to make a film that can't be filmed because the screenwriter is already dead. That's for a short synopsis, searching for the non-existent. That's for a logline. A film with no people at all? Well, almost. The dead man's memory is like jerky smartphone videos I'm now going to tell you my kind of Scottish nickname they gave me at the film school. <laughs>